But we will be beginning on page six um, here this evening as we finished up um, page five last week. And we'll shoot for, for page 10, I think would be a good, a good um, breaking point for us here, a breaking point for us here um, um, tonight. So let us begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the everlasting word who came to supply our salvation. This evening, we give thanks that you continue to come to us through your visible word, by which you strengthen our faith. Prepare our hearts to hear what you say, so that we might be empowered to put our confidence in you. Amen. So last time we had that opportunity to kind of just jump in and say, okay, what are some of the situations that are going on in the congregation there in Corinth? Um, as, you, as we could say, in, in a way, the congregation there in Corinth was the Apostle Paul's problem child. Um, and yet at the same time, we also recognize that he considered them to be believers. He speaks in that capacity as, yes, absolutely, um, he considers them to be believers. And then he, he jumped into one of the first issues that he is addressing, and that is the divisions that are within the congregation there. And now he, he comes here into 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, and really what, what's going to be carrying out from the section here until kind of the end of what we look at is, is the fact that the believer and the unbeliever view the cross completely differently. Um, and, and as he lays this, this information out, as he lays these truths out, uh, you know, the Corinthians' high opinion of themselves, their high esteem of themselves, really what was, was causing a lot of the division within their congregation. And so what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's, he's putting worldly win- wisdom into its proper perspective. Um, and so here you have all these divisions because you think so highly of yourself, because of you think you're so, so worldly wise. Um, well, let's talk about what worldly wisdom really is, especially when you look at it in comparison to the cross. So, um, verses 18 to 25. And would someone like to read those verses, 18 to 25? Go ahead, Nancy. So in many respects, what we see there in those verses is um, a a great description of the theology of the cross. Um, And and when you think about the theology of the cross, what we're really talking about is how how God chose to reveal himself through through the cross and not through demonstrations of glory and of, of human wisdom, but rather through the sacrifice of his son, um, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And, and the reality of the matter is, is if we want to know who God is, we need to look right there into the face of that beaten and battered and bruised and bloodied man, Jesus. Because when we look at Jesus, and we look at him um, beaten, battered, bruised, and bloodied, we see exactly how God feels about us. We see exactly to what extent God is going to go to help us. Um, We see his true nature. Um, The theology of the cross. And and the theology of the cross, of course, is is there in 
in contrast to what the world would say they, they want a theology of glory, um, of glory here in this life, ease here in this life. Um, but the Apostle Paul says, no, the cross of Christ is where we focus our attention. We preach Christ crucified, which is offensive to Jews. Um, it was offensive to the Jews um, because it was a completely different Messiah than that, what they were looking for. Um, the Jews were looking for a political Messiah who would establish an earthly kingdom. They were looking for a theology of glory. Um, and therefore, Christ, one who was humble, one who eventually went to the cross, one who preached and taught and, and did everything for the life to come, he was offensive to them because it wasn't what they were looking for or what they wanted. We preach Christ crucified, which is foolishness to the Greeks. Well, the Greeks considered the death and the crucifixion of Christ um, as just like anything else, the death of a criminal. Um, and so it was foolishness to them. How, how could there be spiritual significance in this, is what the Greek would say. Um, how could somebody who's supposed to be a king die like a, a criminal? So ultimately what you could say is that the Jews and the Greeks, in large part, were looking for a different type of savior, something different from God. And perhaps that's a really good question for us to ask, or ask ourselves. So do we ever fall into that category of looking for something different from God than what he's promised to give us? Um, do we find ourselves getting upset or dissatisfied with God because our life isn't going the way we had planned as if he had promised us an easy life? Um, do we look one for one who is going to be more political? Um, one who's going to banish sufferings? Um, one who is going to you know, assure civil rights? We'll, we'll get to talk about that as we go along. Is um, How many churches today have a exchange the theology of the cross for a God of politics, a God of civil rights. Um, because they want the church to be this great power in the world, and they don't think that the cross of Christ could be powerful enough. Um, and we need to ask ourselves, do we sometimes fall into that trap as well. I'm looking for God to be something other than what he's revealed himself as. Um, but we preach Christ crucified. Um, you'll see that word there too, as, um, dynamis. Um, it's the Greek word for power. And so as you see those, those words of, of scripture talking about how, how Christ and the power of God, um, it's actually also where we get the English word dynamite. Um, so think about that. Um, Christ is the power of God, and it's powerful. He's powerful like dynamite. That's what really is trying to be emphasized in that whole aspect. Um, so, as I said before, the Apostle Paul is saying, okay, you Corinthians, you, you smug Corinthians, you, you Corinthians who are so full of yourself and now are causing divisions, look at your wisdom compared to God's. Um, come on now. Let's, let's, get things, let's get things straight. Um, let's Let's look at some questions. So searching the scripture. In verse 18, Paul refers to the message of the cross, which he identifies as the power of God. Let's review the critical importance of the cross of Christ by answering the following questions. So why do we need saving? Um, Romans 3, 10 to 12. Would someone like to read that? Go ahead, Evan. Why don't you even read that next one too? For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, sub A. So why do we need saving? We're sinners. Because we're sinners. Um, we're sinners who, who what? Who by nature are without the righteousness 
that God demands. Um, you think about that passage. There is no one righteous. Um, that's what God requires, though. Um, by nature, we lack that righteousness that God requires, and we can do nothing to achieve it on our own. Um, that's why we need to be saved. How did God save us? Um, John 19 and Colossians 1. Maybe you want to take both of those. Would someone like to read them? Mark. So how did God save us? Through Christ. Um, through that perfect life of Christ and the substitutionary death of, of Christ on that cross. Um, he reconciled. What, what beautiful picture words the Bible continuously uses. Um, you know, that idea of reconciliation. Um, in order for there to be reconciliation, um, there has to be a bringing together. Um, now, normally, we think of, of a reconciliation taking place because one person gives a little, another person gives a little, and you come together to meet in the middle. But um, God's not giving any on his holiness, um, and we can't step toward him. So what happened? Jesus comes in the middle, and he brings us to God um, and brings about the reconciliation himself. Why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer a cruel death on the cross to accomplish our salvation? Hebrews 9 and 2 Corinthians. Does someone want to read those two passages? Go ahead, Karen. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So why was it necessary for Jews to suffer a cruel death on the cross to accomplish our salvation? Evan? Taking from Hebrews, blood needed be shed for sin. And from the second Corinthians, the righteousness of Christ So we have that aspect of what, what we have looked at a number of different situations of that great exchange, right? Um, if you think of, of, the, of the individual on one side and the cross on the other side, um, the arrows go. And, and what happens is from us, our sins go to Christ and he suffers and, and dies and pays for them all with the shedding of his blood. That's the only thing that was precious and holy enough to satisfy God's justice. And his righteousness and holiness is given to us as that free gift, that great um, exchange. And you might say, well, this, this is simplistic stuff. Um, it's not simplistic. And, and, and that's going to be one of the neat and amazing things that we're going to see here in just a moment is... Um, Look at what you know that actually the wise of the world don't. Um, and it's incredible that you know it and that you believe it. And, and it's, it's not something to simply be taken for granted or say, this is, this is so simplistic, I don't need this anymore. This is the foundation of our faith. Yes, do we build um, other aspects on it? We'll talk about that in a few moments too. Certainly we do. Um, but nothing makes sense if it is not seen through the lens of the cross of Christ. The entire Bible and, and what it has to say only is illuminated and made clear to us when we understand this truth first. I'm digging a little deeper. Is there really a foolishness of God or a weakness of God? Is there really a foolishness of God or a weakness of God? Um, for the Apostle Paul talks about that aspect of, you know, foolishness of God, weakness of God. Is there really such a thing? Is 
Simply giving people opportunity to think. Mark. Yeah, I mean, and you're right on in the aspect of, the answer is no. Um, there is no foolishness of God. Um, there is no weakness of God. But that's how the world perceives it, right? Um, or as you, as you said, that's the way the sinful flesh is going to perceive it. Um, we, by the grace of God, don't see it as foolishness. We don't see it as weakness. We see it as power. Um, but that is the way that the, the unbelieving world world sees it. So what, what Paul is simply doing here is he is contrasting godly wisdom with the wisdom of the world and the way that the wisdom of the world looks at things. And we'll see that even, even some more in the next section that we, we look at. Um, question B. Paul speaks of the power of God and the wisdom of God. What wonderful assurance and reminder is there in those two phrases for the person who is attempting to communicate the gospel to others? What assurance and reminder is there? Evan. Okay, so we, we have that power. Um, and, and let's take it a step further in that aspect of, of, of where's the assurance there? Where, where's, and where's, what's this reminder for us in that regard? We, we have this power. Um, where's the assurance and what's the reminder? Um, the, assurance, uh, the assurance is, is that we simply are called upon to communicate the gospel and the message of Christ as clearly as we can. And the assurances and the comfort is, is that the power is within the words we share, not in how we share it. Um, the assurance is and the comfort is in the fact that the, the effect of that message, of whether it, it is going to be accepted or rejected, is not our responsibility. What's the reminder? The reminder would be is that it would be inappropriate and unnecessary to think that we need, we need to strengthen the gospel message with some sort of technique or, or persuasion on our part. Um, we want to communicate, communicate it clearly. Um, as clearly as we can. We, we, we want to communicate it and, and put as few stumbling blocks in the way of the Holy Spirit's work as possible. Um, but it's not our responsibility for it to be accepted or rejected. Um, and it's unnecessary for us to try and fancy it up um, because the power is in the Word. Questions or comments on that section? If not, let's take a look at our next section. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 2, 5. For example, consider your call, brothers. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. Not many were powerful, and not many were born with high status. But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame those who are wise. God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are strong. And God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to do away with the things that are, so that no one may boast before God. But because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, namely, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God did this so that, just as it is written, 
Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So if you think about the end of verse 30 there, um, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Here, there's the reason to boast that the Apostle Paul is saying. Um, he's, he's wanting to fill them with the joy and the confidence that comes from God's grace in Christ. Um, there's your reason to be boasting. Continuing on with chapter 2. As for me, brothers, when I came to you, I did not come with superior speech or wisdom in order to proclaim to you the testimony of God. For I had no intention of knowing anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not marked by persuasive words of human wisdom, but by a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So, so there in verses 28 and following, he talks about the foolish things, the weak things, and the lowly things. Um, so, so what would that, that be? That'd be, um, you know, being poor, or, or at least not wealthy. It would be being non-scholarly. You know, rather than being the, 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 the brightest of the world, the non-scholarly. Uh, it would be those who would not be considered powerful in this world. You know, all the things that the world would consider to be weak, lowly, and foolish. That's, that's all that's being talked about there. Um, and, and think, too, if you recall, when we, we began this, I said um, the city of Corinth at that time was maybe um, the, the size of about 200,000 people with 500,000 slaves. Um, one of those slaves, servant slaves, that'd be the foolish, the weak, the lowly. Um, it's very possible that um, one of the individuals reading this letter or hearing this letter would have been Philemon. Um, and, and so you, 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 you consider this aspect of all those things that the world would consider unimportant. Um, the Lord uses those things. To, to shame the wisdom of the world. Um, Paul says, I had no intention of knowing anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, that does not mean that the only thing that Paul, the Apostle Paul ever talked about was the events of Good Friday. Um, I oftentimes say in my, my Bible instruction class, when it comes to um, the lesson on Holy Communion, in our practice of close communion, when it comes to the, the lesson on um, church fellowship, and when it comes to the lesson on um, the roles that the Lord has laid down in Scripture for husbands and wives and, and men and women, is I say, if you were to go out and ask people in our community what our church is known for, they might say, it's the church that won't let me commune with them if I just happen to come in. Or they might say, it's the church that doesn't do a bunch of other things with other churches in town. And I'd say, you might hear that, but I pray that as you are in this church for a little while, you'll find out that really what we want to be known for and I strive to be known for is to preach Christ crucified. That everything is flowing from that truth. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Um, and, and as I said before, no matter what doctrine is being explained, no matter what teaching is being spoken about, um, it needs to always be spoken of in light of the gospel, in light of the cross of Christ, because nothing is going to make sense apart from that. Um, it has to shine through first. And then the Apostle Paul. This almost seems kind of strange, doesn't it? He says, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and with much trembling. Um, you know, we think of the Apostle Paul as, and, and, and the willingness to be persecuted the way that he was, to be, to be beaten the way that he was. Um, did he ever have this fear and, and this trembling and this weakness? Um, the answer is yes. He was like any other human being. And really we could point to three things. Right before this, he had preached in the city of Athens. Um, if you go back in the, in the book of Acts to, to read through that, you'll find that Paul met with very, very little success in Athens. 
And so you could see him coming now to Corinth. Is, are the Corinthians going to be the same way? Is it going to be very difficult for, 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 to win them with the gospel? Um, not a doubt in the power of the gospel, but, but will they respond the same way the Athenians did? Um, next, you could say, here he comes with this aspect, because what does he see in the city of Corinth? He sees a bunch of people who are living a very licentious life, a, a life in which they are seeing a license to sin, to, to, to give in to all of their, their passions. Um, are they going to be willing are they going to be willing to give up the lusts of the flesh and the worldly, worldly ways? Um, think about it. If you've ever witnessed to somebody and, and you, you've witnessed to them and, and you know the type of life they, they, they've lived, you, you might even find yourself kind of feeling that way sometimes. Well, I'll share this with them, but how are they going to react to this? Um, and what are they going to say about this? And will they really even listen to it? And then you can also add on top of that, um, Look at what he's, he's proclaiming. Something that the world considers foolish. Something that the world considers to be weak. How do you think you would feel if you stood in front of a university in a classroom and you stood in front of all of the most educated of that, of that um, university um, who, who hold all these PhDs in science and everything else, um, and especially when they were holding to the ways of the world. Do you think you might be a little bit nervous and say, what, what kind of questions are you going to throw at me? How much are they going to ridicule me when I tell them that God made this world when they've believed in evolution all this time? When I tell them that you're saved because Christ died on a cross for you and these people are, the, the, their goal in life is how, how much money can I get and, and how, how, how much stuff can I get in this world and, and can, I, can I live to be as long as, as long as I can and to get everything else? Um, I would be nervous. That's Paul as he stands in front of these people who, who consider themselves so worldly, worldly wise. Um, and yet, what does he do? He places the confidence simply in the word. Search in the scripture. How did God make it evident in the Corinthian congregation that human wisdom, power, and prestige do not bring men to God? Um, and it's, it's really what he's talking about there, really, in the, in the first couple of verses of that section. Rick. Yeah, God chose the, low, the lowly things of the world, the despised things, and things that people didn't really want anything to do with. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's not an insult on the part of the Apostle Paul. But do you notice what he says? Um, and, and guys, Corinthians, Christians, you are those lowly ones. You are those weak ones. Um, you're the ones that nobody really considers to be all that great. Um, it, it's, like I said, not an insult. What he's really doing is, Look at what you know. Look at what you have. Look at what you possess that the worldly wise do not. God doesn't need the world's wisdom to bring about the great things. Um, and so he actually points to them as evidence. Um, they weren't influential. They weren't wise. They weren't popular in the world. Um, they weren't the, the aristocratic, the brilliant ones. And yet God chose to do great through, things through them. They knew things that the wise of the world didn't know. Let's dig a little deeper. In what ways is the contest of human wisdom, that is philosophy, and divine wisdom, which is the revelation of scripture, in what ways is that contest affecting many church bodies today? I kind of talked about this just a little bit before. I jumped ahead a little bit, but. Rachel. Yeah, there, many are going the ways of the philosophical direction. And, and what would the philosophical direction be? Our opinion. Yeah. Um, so the wisdom of man is more, more, more wise than, than the revelation of God. Human reason, um, directing and driving that those 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 decisions, the the preaching and the um, aspects in there. Trying to uh, enforce a more um, a utopia on earth when you can't undo the fact that this is a simple world. So trying to be like, well, if only the 
church had more power. If only we had more morality. And so as you, as you use that terminology of a, a utopia, um, we kind of come back to that idea of what we talked about before is the adoption of a social gospel, right? Um, what becomes the goal, what becomes the, the reason for the church's existence in some situations, um, the reason for a church's existence becomes to make life better for people on this earth. Now, does a church want to have a concern for the physical well-being of not only its members, but the people in the world? Absolutely they do. Uh, in fact, such concern ought to and should flow from the love that Christ had for us. And, and as you look at scripture, right, um, look at how the Lord again and again even took care of and helped with the physical needs of people. But, but what was his, his goal for coming to this earth? His goal for coming to the earth was not to make the physical lives of people better. Um, it was to make their spiritual lives right. Um, that's the goal of the church. That's the reason for our existence. Um, it's, it's the reason that we strive in everything that we do as an as a organization, as a church, to always have the gospel be the driving force behind what we do and why we do things. Um, yeah, we, we have a Bible soccer camp, but why... What, what, what is really the point of it? The point of it is to, to share the gospel message. Um, we have the Easter for kids, but what do we make sure that we have as part of it? The sharing of the gospel message. Um, we, we don't just have activities for the sake of activity. Um, we have the gospel message. And, and as, we, as we announce to a community and we invite people to these, these things, um, what, is our, what is our goal? Not to dupe them to come in to say, well, you're going to come thinking that you're only going to have soccer, and then we're going to happen to hit you upside the head with some of the Bible, too. Uh, no, we tell them, this is something that is a Bible soccer camp. This is about the Bible. We just happen to be having some soccer um, tied in with it. The same way the VBSs sometimes would have, you know, I, growing up, VBS. I looked forward to VBS because we play kickball. Um, oh, I... I I, didn't, I enjoyed the, the aspects of, of hearing the word of God, but I, I liked kickball. Um, you know, but it's the gospel. And that's, that's what we're all about. That's the reason for our existence. Um, how is Christ the wisdom of God? How is Christ the wisdom of God? A wisdom of God. Mark? He's the solution that works. I like the way you put it. Um, he is the solution that works. Uh, exactly. It is through Christ that God rescues and saves people for all, all eternity. Uh, the highest wisdom there is is to know Christ in faith as Savior. There is no higher wisdom um, in this world than that. I'm not saying that we can't go and seek to get um, PhDs and doctorates in, in other things, but the highest wisdom there is is to know Christ in faith. What does, that, what does this say we should be looking for in a preacher and in a sermon? One who teaches God's word and truth and purity, and it centers on what? Um, the cross of Christ. Christ crucified. We're really going to get into this in chapters 3 and 4 um, for the Apostle Paul as he defends his ministry amongst the Corinthians. He, um, he stresses a lot about what, what the, they should be looking for in a preacher. But it, it's a good reminder for us that, you know, there might not always be... Um, a, a, a matching up or, or maybe a, a perfect um, you know, re relatability with, with a pastor. Maybe, maybe the personality is a little more gruff than we would like it to be or, or whatever it might be. 
But if, if that pastor is proclaiming the word of God and his truth and purity, if they're preaching Christ crucified, and if, if the pastor maybe doesn't have the greatest um, oratory skills, um, doesn't have the greatest ability to put together um, you know, this, this, this sermon that, that holds your attention really, really well, um, we need to remember, what am I listening for? I'm not listening for somebody who is, who is a wordsmith. I'm not listening for somebody who is able to just craft marvelous sentences. I'm, I'm looking for an individual who tells me I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And who tells me that that Savior is Jesus Christ and that he has done everything for me. Um, and to expound on that truth. And, and, and I say this and as we jump into to it. I don't want to jump too much into our next next section, but I say this too is, you know, I've, I've I had a, a, a an individual once say to me that, you know, they they went to church and, and the pastor um, made up made up a word that day and preached on the made up word, um, and I and I said, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, are you sure that's all that was spoken about in that, or was it a case of you just didn't particularly like the, the direction the pastor was going, and you, so you kind of focused only on that aspect? I said, but the responsibility is then also to a degree on you to get from it what you can. Um, and there's the blessing of our Lutheran liturgy, too, is, is while perhaps that sermon um, left something to be desired that day, what a blessing that that the law and the gospel were proclaimed in liturgy. What a blessing when the sacrament is celebrated and we're able to have that aspect too. Um, and so what are we looking for? We're looking for that, that preacher who's going to proclaim God's word and to preach Christ. And what lessons today do you think Christians might draw from what Paul says about his sharing of the gospel? Evan. Probably a, a, a comfort that, that Paul was in a similar situation to us that we put our trust in the Word of God and let God's work in the Lord, the Holy Spirit do that, the building of faith, and we simply uh, spread the, the gospel and its truth and the purity that we, we don't have to worry about having a distinct inflection Yeah, so recognizing, um, kind of coming back to what we talked about a little bit before, is recognizing that, that God's word has its own persuasive power, doesn't it? Um, and, and I think sometimes it can be a, it can be a challenge, um, especially for individuals who have been in the faith their entire life, um, to just recognize that persuasive power. Because by the grace of God, that, that truth has been just... Um, really laid on into our heart and onto our mind so frequently, it was something we've always known. And, and so we just say, yeah, I recognize it, but we, we maybe don't notice it in the same regard as if I see how I was living this life, you know, like, like an individual who, who completely rejected everything that had to do with God's word. And then all of a sudden, um, one day they, they woke up and they said, boy, I've heard the word of God, and it it changed my life. Um, and they can they can just see it sometimes in a in a in a different way. Um, but absolutely, um, to recognize that God's word has its own persuasive power, and also when it comes to us sharing sharing the the word of God, what do we want to be our focus as well? Um, our focus needs to be Christ crucified. I can almost guarantee that probably anybody who has had a conversation with somebody who either doesn't know 
the truth of Christ or is a confused Christian um, has probably had a lot of people ask questions about peripheral things, things that really are not the heart and center of the Bible. Um, you know, and people sometimes love to even bring up the questions, well, so can, can God make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? Um, you know, to try and to challenge God in his word. Um, or, or even when it comes to things such as evolution, is, is there's that temptation to dive into science or to dive into disproving evolution rather than simply preaching Christ. Um, and and I, I can think of situations, too, of where, where I've, I've had individuals um, living in a sinful lifestyle, um, individuals who, who have, have a, a, a vague understanding of what God's word truly says, um, but tell me that as we go through the Bible instruction class and we go through the first few lessons, which is just the heart and center of the Bible, to say, um, are we going to get to something else? Because this is just basic stuff. And I said, I don't think you know the basic stuff really that well yet. Um, this is what we need. This is what's, going to, this is what's going to shed the light on all your other questions that you have. Uh, I remember just, just a week or two ago, I don't remember what the conversation was about, but th th there's an individual in the, in the prison that it's only the second time I ever met with him, and he, he was going off over here, he was going off over there. Um, politics was coming up, and, and you know, how is it possible that this is being said about this politician, but then this is being said about this politician? And I said to him, whoa, whoa, let's wait a second. I said, you're talking about all sorts of things that will never make any sense to you until you first hear about Christ and him dying to pay for your sins. You first need to see you're a sinner. You first need to see how Christ did all this. So let's study it in an organized fashion. Um, and that's also something we need to remember when we share the gospel. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Um, but at the same time, did Paul develop his communication skill? Absolutely, he did. Um, is there value in us developing and enhancing and growing in our communication skills? Absolutely, there is. Um, not because we doubt the power of God's word, but because we don't want to stand in the way of the Spirit in any way. Um, so you, you balance that, but remember the persuasive powers in the word. Um, any questions on that section before we jump into 6 to 16? Reading then with verse 6. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, but it is not a wisdom of this world or of the rulers of this world who are being reduced to nothing. Instead, we speak God's wisdom that has been hidden in mystery. Before the ages, God foreordained that this wisdom would result in our glory. Um, this is the oldest wisdom there is, isn't it? Because even before the world was created, God already planned our salvation in Christ. It is the oldest wisdom in, in the world. Um, none of the rulers of this world knew it. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no human mind has conceived, that is what God has prepared for those who love him. But God revealed it to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Indeed, who among men knows a man's thoughts except the man's spirit within him? So also, no one else knows God's thoughts except God's spirit. What we received is not the spirit of the world. Um, we could ultimately say the spirit of the world is what? Humanism. And what is humanism? Humanism is ultimately making a god out of man. Um, evolution is humanism. Um, you know, at any point of where uh, an individual sets themselves up over against what God's word says, humanism. Because what are they saying? My reason, my thoughts stand in judgment over anything God has revealed to me. So what we received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we might know the blessings freely given to us by God. 
We also speak about these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual truths with spiritual words. However, an unspiritual person does not accept the truths taught by God's Spirit, because they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually evaluated. But the spiritual person evaluates all things, and he himself is evaluated by no one. Indeed, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Um, that verse 14, um, I, I, I really appreciate the EHV's translation of it. Um, not that the NIV translation of it was bad or improper, but I, I think the EHV translation of it does a nice job of, of really saying that the only way that one can really understand what the, the Word of God has to say is if they're spiritually evaluated. Um, and the only way that it can be spiritually evaluated is if the Spirit is dwelling within that person. Um, that's the only way we can understand Scripture. It's, it's another way of saying the same thing that Paul said elsewhere, is that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Um, it, apart from the Holy Spirit, one can't, can't recognize that. And stop and think about that. Those who believe, you and I, what do we possess? We possess the Spirit. And in possessing the Spirit, what happens? We can understand the spiritual words. That's what he's, what he's saying. So, um, a couple notes here to talk about here. Um, we do speak wisdom. So, so the Apostle Paul from this section has been talking about, right, the foolishness, the weakness of God. He says, don't for a second, though, think that God's word is stupid. It is not. Um, don't call, call God's word foolishness, because it's not. Um, he's downplayed wisdom all along, but don't think that we don't have a wisdom. We actually do. We have the greatest wisdom there is. Um, True wisdom comes from the wisdom of knowing why Christ went to the cross, what he accomplished at the cross, and what it means for us. That's true wisdom. When he uses the word mature, or mature, um, so often our mind goes to somebody who is, is maybe a, um, a believer who has grown in their faith. Um, that's not what he's talking about. He's simply talking about a believer because he's contrasting the believer with the unbeliever here. So the mature is simply the believer. Um, he's, he's not contrasting strong and weak. He's contrasting believer and unbeliever. Um, an interesting phrase, isn't it? Um, the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Um, first thing we have to admit, they're mysterious words. Um, and they're mysterious words because it's all part of a very mysterious Trinity. Um, and when I say mysterious, I don't mean um, unknowable. What I'm saying is unable to fit into human reason. Um, how is it that there's three persons yet only one God? How is it that, that all can be fully one, each individual, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yet only be one God? But that's what the Bible says. Um, it's a mystery but a mystery that we receive by faith, one that we believe by faith. Um, but what is Paul doing there? Here's the picture that he's, he's, he's really saying. Okay, a man's spirit, if, if you think about an individual, a man's spirit understands his own thoughts, right? Um, and, and one would say that a man's spirit understands their thoughts better than anything else. But just because the reference is to a man's spirit, doesn't mean that the spirit is not part of the man. So, so don't think that because it says God's spirit, that somehow it's divorcing the Holy Spirit as being true God. It's not. Um, the spirit understands God's thoughts. Um, so in the way that a spirit of a man knows their thoughts, the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God and just because it's referencing this aspect of um, that is the Spirit of God does not take it away from being true God. Here's the reason why the authors of the creed say what they say. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mystery, but they, they use the word proceed to try and, and bring out this aspect of, of being sent out by the Father, being sent out from the, by, from the Son, proceeding from Father and Son. Um, that Spirit knows this and he enlightens us. It, it just ties into last Sunday's sermon, right, of, of this light being turned on because the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, takes us from spirit to darkness to spiritual light. Um, and then that aspect of the unspiritual person versus the spiritual person. I'm just consider this. The unspiritual person can only think they know what this world is about. However, does the person of the world really know what sin and guilt are? Do they know the depth of wickedness in the heart of man? Do they know the answers to the problems of sickness and suffering? Why there will always be crime and war? What the true worth of earthly possessions are? Do they know why this world will never achieve justice and equality? Why death reigns? What is the hereafter? Who is God? It sounds like arrogance to the world, but God says the spiritual person knows and that natural man doesn't know. God's people, who gain their spiritual and moral wisdom from Scripture, are right. The people of the world are wrong. It's that simple. Um, and it's not arrogance, unless we were to think that somehow we discover that on our own. Um, that would be arrogant. We'd be boasting in all the wrong things. Um, we know it, because the Spirit has revealed it to us. Um, and therefore, it's not arrogance. You know, go think about all those questions above. Um, you know the answers to all those. There, there's times that we struggle because of the sinful flesh still living within us, but we know the answer to them. Think about how incredible that is, is that you know the answer to all those questions that so many people in this world are still struggling to find the wisdom of God. Um, and so see this once again in the context of what Paul's writing in this, these first two chapters. Stop your boasting and stop your clickishness. The only reason you know what you know is because the Spirit has nothing to do with you. Um, that's what he's trying to remind them. Let's search the scriptures with a couple questions and then a digging deeper question. In what sense is God's wisdom a mystery? Rachel. Unable to fit into human reason, and how is the only way we're going to know it? Is if he does what? Yep. Only if he reveals it to us. I mean, it's a mystery because... We can only know it if he reveals it to us. Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to consider how arrogant it is then for any human being to presume that we should be able to tell God what he's like? If we couldn't know him um, and we couldn't know this wisdom without him revealing it to us, uh, and just maybe put it into this aspect, Maybe you've been there before, um, but maybe you haven't. But you meet somebody for the very first time. And, and this person that you meet um, is, is an interesting individual who, who thinks very highly of themselves. And, and they meet you for the very first time. They spend about five minutes with you, and they think they have you figured out and peg you for being this type of person that acts like this all the time. What do you, you walk away from that person, what do you think about them? How arrogant and what a jerk to think that they could figure me out in five minutes. You wonder if God doesn't just look down at the world of the people who don't want to listen to what God's word says, the only place he's truly revealed himself, and they think that they have God all figured out. Oh, he's just love. He doesn't really mind it when people live this type of lifestyle. Oh, you know, he's actually kind of a worthless God and a weak God because, you know what, he can't seem to stop any of the problems in this world. I think they have them all figured out. But they won't listen to the one place he reveals himself. 
Um, how arrogant on the part of man. I mean, and once again, the application to ourselves. Um, how arrogant on our part if we find ourselves in a situation where we think that we are, are going to sit in judgment over God and say, something's wrong with you. Rather than going to his word and letting us listen to what he says to us. Question two. What vitally important biblical doctrine is verse 13 presenting? Evan? Yep, so it's, it's verbal inspiration. Um, the, the truth that scripture has been written because God gave them the words that he wanted them to write. Um, it's valuable to point out again and again those different sections where we see it. You know, we, we have passages we go to. No prophecy ever had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But, but the fact that Scripture is verbally inspired is, is found woven through so many different sections of God's Word. Here's another one. Um, we're speaking spiritual words to you um, because they've been revealed to us. They've been given to us. Um, we're not speaking our own. Um, vitally important teaching and a tremendously comforting and assuring one too. Um, the last question. What are some characteristics of a mature Christian? Okay, one who daily studies God's word. One who, one who's going to be digging into that word on that, that regular basis and, and growing in understanding. And here's the thing, too. This is the reason I asked it. Because of this, this section of the Apostle Paul talking about we preach, I, I, I wanted to know nothing but Christ crucified. One who digs deeply into God's word is always wanting to let God's word give more and more. And yet at the same time recognizing all the while I want to keep myself grounded in this truth that even the youngest child can understand. I don't ever leave that. The mature Christian never tires of the simple and yet amazing proclamation of Christ crucified. Um, perhaps you have come across the Christian um, who has who has given the indication that they think that's for just little kids, um, that message, I need more. Um, it's not a case of saying that's for little kids, I need more. It's that's my foundation and let me just study more. But it always comes back to that. So the mature Christian, one who digs deeply into that word but always recognizes that they keep grounded on that gospel that even the inexperienced can understand. Um, and then maybe what, uh, one other aspect we would say is, is what? Is the mature Christian not only studies God's word, shares it, shares it and lives it. Yeah, um, both of those would be, be vitally important things to keep in mind too. Um, shows itself in, in love, right? In patience, in, in understanding, in kindness, um, in forgiving, um, all those Christian attitudes that the scripture talks about. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things of anybody who ever says that I, I've, I've graduated from the word um, is, is so, so silly because they're not putting all those virtues into practice, I can guarantee it, because nobody can. Um, thus the need always for the word to be able to continue to, to fill that up. Questions or comments? Like I said, I hope to get there. We did a, um, a good place to break. So if you recall, our, our theme of the first two chapters was really looking at that aspect of forgiveness and the power for improvement. Um, the Apostle Paul speaking to those, those believers, those Christians, in that aspect of saying, um, I, I do believe you are still believers. Um, there's forgiveness in Christ. That's why he mentioned Christ so much at the beginning there. And he's saying, but there's also, there's, there's room for improvement because the blood of Christ doesn't just forgive sins, but it's also that, that source of power and strength to go out and, 
and live the way that, that you've been called to live. Much like, once again, we go back to our, our sermon this past week, to be who, who God has made us to be. Let's close with prayer then. Lord Jesus, our only Savior, we offer our sincere thanks to you. In love you came to earth, and in humility you presented to your Father your life and death as payment for our sins. Teach us each day to value your work for us as our most precious treasure, and lead us to rely on it with our entire hearts. Amen. Everyone have a good evening.